All right, thank you, Chanley. The think tank tonight. Criminal defense attorneys Michael Bixon and Rachel Kaufman and in New York, criminal defense attorneys Norman Williams and Joseph Marone. Joseph, to you first. Has the state proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Harvey Weinstein is a sexual predator? Their case is over. Listen, they, they've made a great case. Listen, they, they've connected all the alleged victims and witnesses. Um, starting out with Annabelle Escura, she was fantastic. She was consistent. She was believable. The victims themselves, the Molinol witnesses. I mean, ultimately, when these six women came forward, and it wasn't just the women's stories were consistent and credible. They were believable, but they had other witnesses to corroborate their story. So right now, it's an uphill battle for the defense, even though they spent a lot of time on cross-examination, trying to undermine their testimony to show that there was inconsistencies and the fact that there was ongoing contact and relationships with Weinstein. But I don't think they made much of a dent. And I think right now they got a big, big problem to overcome, and I think the, the state's made its burden. Joseph, do, has the defense, though, set the table for potential success if they can knock it out of the park, in their case in chief, and then in the close? Well, listen, that's been their theme. It's been a tough case from the beginning. The defense said that they were going to be able to poke holes and be able to show that, listen, you can't believe these women. These women were in it for a reason. They were in it for their own gain that if you listen to their stories, that if you listen to a lot of evidence that came out through post emails with Harvey Weinstein, with text, that they continued as business as usual, which showed that there really wasn't a rape. It was a consensual act, that they did it maybe for the benefit of their own good. But that was their storyline that they've been playing. And to the, to the extent the state has done the opposite and said, this, not, this can't be true. This, and these women were taken advantage of. And that this man, Harvey Weinstein, is a predator. And he had basically, he attacked them, he raped them. And their stories are consistent and believable. So that's where it's at. And right now, I think the defense, they're going to, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, I was just say, Norman, the, the defense, though, has made some inroads, right? I mean, there's been such a trail with these extended relationships with the defendant, even post-alleged assault. They've got a lot to work with. No, I think so. I think they've definitely poked some holes. Like everyone else has said, this is definitely an uphill battle. Whenever you have a slew of Molino witnesses coming in against you, it's hard to, to, to fight that amount, that amount of evidence. But I do think that there are enough parts of the story of how Hollywood works, how actors and, and producers work and directors work, that I think that the defense will be able to have something to say. The worst moment for a defense attorney is when you have nothing to say in closing. And I think they have a lot to talk about. Well, oh, absolutely. Michael Bixon, your take to this point, uh, to what extent is the defense facing an uphill battle? Or do you think that they're doing pretty well? I think a lot of the testimony that we've seen from the state side has been really, really hard for the defense to overcome. I think they've done an incredible job at doing that, though, uh, at picking apart a lot of the testimony and pointing out a lot of the inconsistencies that we've seen so far. Um, I think one of the biggest problems for the defense to, they're going to have to overcome as this case has gone on is not just the, the witnesses who've come forward and testified about the things that you know, has directly happened to them from Mr. Weinstein, but the supporting witnesses who've come and actually said, hey, we've heard about this a long time ago from these people, and you know, they're not just coming forward now. We've known about this for a while. And you know, with that knowledge and the amount of time that's gone by, it's hard to really overcome not just the person who's saying, hey, he did X, Y, Z to me, but the other people who are coming forward and saying, we've heard about this before. I think it's very hard to overcome as a defense attorney. Um, that being said, I think, they, again, they've done an excellent job um, you know, in defending Mr. Weinstein and pointing out the incons inconsistencies that we've seen so far. Well, Rachel Kaufman, I know you disagree. The, uh, these, uh, there's problems with every one of these witnesses, aren't there? Doesn't the defense have a huge opportunity here? I think they have a huge opportunity, and I think that so far, even though it's been the state's case and it's been the state's witnesses, that the defense on cross-examination has got out a great deal of evidence that supports a reason to doubt the story of these alleged victims. So I think that the defense is definitely in a good position to the extent that all these women, even though they're describing this environment that makes them uncomfortable and that this guy's a creep and all this stuff that they got themselves into, the problem is, is that the relationships that they, that they carried on with him after just really call into question um, how firm they were that they didn't want something um, until after it happened and it didn't serve them. 
and maybe until after the Me Too movement exploded. <laughs> Lauren Young, though, did not have this issue. She was on the stand again today for cross-examination. This is the one, one of the six that came in and say, this happened to me. Harvey Weinstein sexually assaulted me, and guess what? She didn't talk to him again. She didn't email him when he was emailing her. She cut off communications with him. Very effective witness. Let's take a listen to some of it. In each of those interviews, did you describe how you got trapped in the bathroom with the defendant? Yes. Did you describe how he masturbated in front of you? Yes. Did you describe how he was holding and grabbing your breast? Yes. Objection sustained. By the way, can you describe the ejaculation when you saw the defendant ejaculate? Objection. Overruled. It didn't look normal. It was like clumpy. Ah, that's so gross. Um, Joseph Marone, is this a sideshow? All of the talk about Harvey Weinstein's anatomy, his disgustingness, the fact that he smells, and, and to what extent do our jurors going to take that into account? Yeah, he's gross. That, that's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Listen, is it a tactic by the state for the jurors to get the jurors to further loathe Weinstein any further than you can? I mean, the man, if you look at him, he looks like a predator. So they're trying to sell this thing. But I think the jurors are smart enough to really kind of dissect the evidence and make a decision as to whether or not there's enough evidence to convict this man based on the testimony of these witnesses. And, and that's where I think it's going to come down to. I, don't, I think all this other stuff is basically is window dressing that the state's trying to put out there that they think is going to take it over the top. I don't think it matters. Rachel, you're hemming and hawing. What, what, what are you hemming and hawing about? Well, I'm thinking to myself that if I'm a juror, um, I don't know who's maybe concerned about my own hygiene or a part of my body that I'm uncomfortable with. I think that they may see that as bullying um, to the extent that nobody wants to have their own bodies and, I don't know, smells put in front of a jury as like evidence that this person's disgusting they wouldn't want it to happen against them and i think it shows the weakness in the state's case that they're going that low does norman could could it, is it possible jurors could have some empathy for harvey weinstein yeah i mean that is possible but but i think really talking about his body it's more of the state's attempt to show that there's some corroboration that these women all experience the same thing at the hands of the same person, which will help with the predatory counts. But that the flip side of that is you will kind of feel sorry for the guy. You know, the, 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 the fat, goofy, pimply, blackhead back guy <laughs> is going to get some sympathy. <laughs> yeah. They can ask the jurors if they have blackheads on their back, so I mean, you just don't yeah. know who you're dealing with. Michael Bixon, would you, how would you, you handle this on, in, in <laughs> close? Do you mention this at all? Do you bring it up? Or is this one of those things you just let? Well, on the up? defense side, no, absolutely not. I mean, I, I think that there is a very good sign to it for the defense that he has been sort of bullied. Um, on the other hand, from the state, I think that it does a very good thing for their case and that it makes it very graphic and visual. It makes it easy to imagine and put yourself in that picture if you're able to see exactly what he looks like and give a more graphic sort of description as to what happened. You know, it's one thing to just sort of hear a story and to really be able to put yourself in there and imagine what it's like given those sort of circumstances that we've seen. You know, I, I think it does make the, the story a lot more powerful. The, one of the things that uh, we have seen throughout this is not only the you know six different witnesses. Judge Burke has allowed three Molina witnesses, uh, Annabella Sciorra, to help with um, the sexual predator charge. No matter what was going to happen here, this was going to be a difficult case, was it not, for the defense, just because of the sheer amount of people telling the exact same story, Joseph? Yeah, listen, that's always the case in these sexual assault cases. And it seems to be the norm with these prosecution, the way they structure these cases. They get multiple witnesses that can consistently tell a story. They roll out an expert, as they did in this case. And they did the same thing in the Cosby case down in Philadelphia, which the second time around when they tried that case, they had more witnesses and they had the expert. And that's what they're doing here. And, and it, the, the more witnesses you have, the more consistent they are, the more believable they are. The jurors say to themselves, listen, it isn't a one-time isolated incident. It's over and over and over again. So it, it adds up to him obviously being guilty. And that's kind of the case they spelled out, and I think they may, may prove it. Norman, is it fair? You agree with Judge Burke allowing all these women in? Um, no, I, I think I think that just gets way too prejudicial. It just looks like propensity, like this guy has a propensity to be a creep. But you know, a lot of times, uh, particularly in New York County, have a tendency to overtry a case, and 
every time I get into that conversation with an assistant, they always say, well, we have a burden. So they want to throw every possible thing that they could throw in there without having regard for the fact that sometimes people's eyes glaze over. You know, for us attorneys, dealing with tons and tons of evidence is easy for us. But for the layperson, it gets kind of boring after a while. Well, Rachel, I don't know how bored this jury has been because uh, they've had person after person tell crazy stories about uh, Harvey Weinstein. Um, but there are 87 accusers out there. I mean, six is nothing. I mean, this guy in the court of public opinion was found guilty months ago, years ago. What do you think? Well, I think that in the court of public opinion that he's a creep and maybe should be blacklisted from Hollywood. But do I think that in a court of law when we're dealing with um, felony charges and we're talking about taking away a man's liberty, I think that we really have to look at the circumstances. We can put Hollywood on trial. Um, we can put the dynamics on trial. I think maybe it's a better civil suit because it definitely could amount to sexual harassment. But I think we're towing a strange line. Is it me too? Um, actionable, sure, but is it criminally actionable? I don't think so. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with Michael, it. Michael, did Judge Burke set the table for success for the state? It makes it very difficult to overcome. I mean, the, as a defense attorney, you don't want that many witnesses coming in, ever. You know, I mean, it, it becomes this almost insurmountable thing, this mountain you can barely climb. Because, yeah, the jurors' eyes, I think, do glaze over at a certain point, but you don't want them to have their eyes sort of glaze over when they're already like convicted him, you know, before the defense has even had their shot at the case. And it becomes difficult when they hear person after person after person come in and tell a similar tale about what he's done. All right, everybody here seems to think that uh, the state is in command, the defense is in trouble. Well, the defense started their case today. When we come back, we'll talk about what the defense has done so far, what they need to do after the break. Stay with us. Okay, all right, so the people now have rested on their direct case. So all the attorneys and I will discuss a number of matters at this point. Ms. Rotuno, are you prepared to say before the jury leaves whether the defense is going to put on a case? Judge, we're going to put on a case. We are prepared to start that this afternoon. Joining me still are think tank in place. Criminal defense attorneys Michael Bixon and Rachel Kaufman and in New York, Joseph Marone and Norman Williams. Um, today, the defense started it's case in chief, and they went after one of the strongest portions of the state's case, and that is Annabella Shiora. She came on and told a compelling story. They didn't have the emails that they had with some of the other witnesses that came in to attack her on cross. So the first witness, Paul Fledcher, a friend of Annabella Shiora's, he basically says, yeah, I was friends with her back in the 90s, and she mentioned this thing that happened with Harvey, but it definitely, to me, seemed like a consensual sexual encounter. Um, I want to get your opinion on the choice of first witness, and then we'll talk about the effectiveness of this witness. Joseph, um, going after Annabella Shiora, smart move out of the gate? I don't think they have a choice, right? She was the most compelling witness. She was the most believable. Unless you can show evidence through another witness who knew her well, that can state clearly that, that she never mentioned rape, that she maybe was uncomfortable, but she didn't talk about being in any way compromised. Um, that, that's their biggest shot, and this is the witness they came out with. Did it work? It doesn't sound like it, but it, it, it's their witness, and that's the, where they're at for, for right now. Let's take a listen to a little bit of her direct um, uh, as the first witness for the defense. And what was the sum and substance of the conversation that you had with Annabella regarding Harvey Weinstein? I remember Annabella saying to me that she's done this crazy thing with Harvey. And do you remember where you were when she said that to you? No. Uh, we were on an extremely long walk that night from Lincoln Center to, uh, I believe we ended up going to a restaurant in Alphabet City, which is, if you know, in New York City, it's, it's like an hour and a half, two hour walk. It was during that walk you remember her talking about doing something crazy with Harvey. Yes. Norman Williams, um, the problem with this witness was cross. Jonah Luzzi, you know her well. Uh, she's a bulldog, and she came armed with emails, and she, she painted the picture that this witness was basically in bed with Harvey Weinstein and that he would do anything for Harvey Weinstein. End of the day, how did he do on the stand, and, and uh, did Jonah Luzzi win? 
I mean, I think the, the defense has to attack Annabella Sciorra. They have no choice. But, and he came out of the gate on direct sounding like he was helpful, for sure. I mean, for him to describe her saying that she did something crazy with Harvey as opposed to describing a trauma, that's definitely helpful to the defense. But, but uh, Luzi's going to get you. Yeah, she, she's good on cross. You know, most assistants are not because all they do is direct. But she's one that's going to come after you. Uh, Rachel, your thoughts? Well, I feel like we all tell ourselves stories um, that we can live with about our past. And I think that any woman who had to admit or was talking about having some sort of relationship with Harvey Weinstein would have to describe it um, in a way that kind of belittles it or makes it sound crazy um, in order to kind of in their heads make sense of what they did. So calling it, no, it was a crazy experience um, is a way for her to process that disgusting experience well, that she's regret, embarrassed regret, about. Regret, regret. We have talked about this a few times on the show recently is I think there's this kind of gray area between Regret, what is not though, consensual regret sex makes, makes and it sound rape. like it's consensual. Michael Bixon, is, regret sex isn't illegal. No, no. I, I mean, here's my big thing with the testimony that we heard from him, right? It's not conclusive. And what is conclusive is the testimony that we heard from Sciorra, right? And there's a big gap between the two. I think it certainly helps the defense. In no way whatsoever does this hurt, right? I think that he's a critical witness. I think that his testimony did help. But the biggest problem is that they're going to have to overcome what you could infer from his testimony as it being consensual, as opposed to her direct testimony, which said it wasn't. And I think that sort of the inference that you're going to have to put into his testimony, it's not going to rise to the same level of weight as you're going to get from hers. Paul Fletcher, all, he basically said that uh, it was characterized as some crazy thing, but then um, it was, in his mind, a sexual thing. Take a listen. And at the time that you had this conversation with Miss Yora, did she explain that whatever crazy thing she did was sexual in nature? Objection. Sustained. Can you expound on what she talked about when she said she did a crazy thing with Harvey Weinstein? Objection. Overruled. Um, her original question, Ms. Rotano's original question, what was your understanding of what this crazy thing was? Okay? So do you understand that question? I do. Can you answer only that question? Yes, sir. Give it a try. Sorry. Uh, my understanding was that she fooled around with him. And did Mr. Ms. Annabella Shiora ever say anything to you about Harvey ever forcing her to do anything? No. Did she ever tell you anything about him coming over to her apartment on Gramercy and forcing his way in? Objection to leading. Objection. Watch the leading. Sure. Did, did Ms. Shiora ever tell you anything about a negative experience with Harvey on Gramercy? No. Joseph, none of the victims that came in reported anything to police out of the gate. Is that a problem, or as a society, have we moved past that, expecting sexual assault victims to immediately go to the police? No, listen, it, it's in the opposite. That's... And that was testified by the expert. That's a common occurrence when a sexual assault victim experience, experiences being sexually assaulted. They usually don't go to anyone. They usually keep it within. They're usually afraid to tell someone. So it is consistent the way a victim does act. So that, that didn't help um, in this case. And, and the other thing, too, is which leading up to this defense's testimony, if you remember, Ms. Sciorra testified that she didn't even know that she was raped. She didn't classify it as rape. She thought rape was something done in a back alley. So whatever she was interpreting the Weinstein did to her that night, she didn't really understand it to be rape. So if you listen to what this defense witness said, it's kind of consistent to her testimony that she, you know, what she did, you know, was something crazy. She doesn't really know what it was. Norma, but don't some of the jurors believe that uh, a rape victim has to act a certain way? And we are expecting a, an expert from the defense to take the stand. I, I do think so. I think that people sometimes will say, well, if it happened to me, this is what I would do. And I think the, the beauty of this witness for the defense is that it appears that he was a friend of hers as well as her agent and that they did have somewhat of a personal relationship and that if anybody, she, she should have been able to trust him to tell him, this guy raped me, as opposed to characterizing it as some crazy thing. You know, it, it just, it's just one of those areas where the defense gets to argue that something doesn't make sense here.
Rachel, would you be skeptical if you were a juror in this case in terms of the reaction <laughs> oh. from the witnesses? I just feel like at the time it was a crazy interaction with Harvey because at the time she still was trying to keep that relationship open and it benefited her to not call it that because maybe it wasn't going to be that. And then when it didn't serve her, when the Me Too movement came along, it, it just, I'm saying that when you look back on a situation and you regret it, you can kind of remember it differently when it serves you now to do so. Michael, how important is the defense witness, the expert witness that we expect tomorrow, who's going to talk about that exact scenario, the, the memories, how they change time, and Annabella Sciorra falls into that because that was 27 years ago. Critical. I think absolutely critical. You have to bring in an expert to talk about the memory issues here because we all know the time is going to be a huge part in this case. I mean, for some of these witnesses, you know, you're talking more than just years. You're talking decades in time that's gone by since this event has happened. And for anyone, I mean, whether you're a victim of sexual violence or just your average Joe and trying to remember what you had for breakfast last week, you know, memory can highly be affected by circumstances, not just, you know, what happened that day, but what happened over time. And so I think it's critical for the defense to bring in an expert and talk about the memory issues that we all know are going to be at play here. Mm, all right, we're going to take a break. Ezra McCandless will be sentenced in Wisconsin tomorrow. Next, we're going to take a look at social media reaction. What should happen to the 22-year-old? Plus, one of the most compelling parts of the O.J. Simpson trial was the testimony that Nicole Brown's dog was so persistent in alerting, alerting neighbors to the murders, even led a neighbor to the crime scene. Take a look at a clip from one of those witnesses. Can you tell us what you saw? Uh, I saw a lady laying down full of blood. I could see the person was a lady, she was blonde. I could see her arm and that's all about it. And that was about it? I turned to my wife and said that there was a dead person there and we, call, we, we tried to call 911 and we, we decided to call 911. Third episode of Court TV's first true crime series, OJ 25. You see the clock ticking away. It airs in just a few minutes, 9 o'clock Eastern, right here on Court TV. You don't want to miss it. I was very surprised to be called as a witness for my brother's murder trial. It's just it's too much. On the next episode of OJ 25. I heard the dog barking between 10.15 and 10.20. They believe that's when the murders happened. You know that for a fact? It was gut-wrenching. I'm turned into a circus. Nobody prepares you for that. An all-new original true crime series, OJ 25. New episode tonight at 9, 8 central. Only on Court TV. Jason is summoned to military training, and before leaving for the two-week assignment, he asks John to look after Ezra. While he is away, Ezra has multiple sexual encounters with John. When Jason returns home in mid-February, he discovers text messages between Ezra and John. Jason confronts Ezra about the texts, and she claims she was sexually assaulted. On February 26th, Jason then calls Eau Claire police to report the sexual assault, and an investigation begins. During the investigation, Ezra tells officers about her other relationship with Alex. Alex is then interviewed by law enforcement in March. He tells police Ezra recently broke up with him and that Ezra willingly had sex with John and that she later regretted it. Officers ultimately closed the sexual assault case without charging John. Ezra went to Alex's home on March 22nd. She claims she was there to return some of his belongings and talk. From his apartment, the two go for a drive in Ezra's car. And exactly what happened during this drive is still a mystery. Later that day, Ezra shows up at a house close to where her car would later be located. She is bloody and covered in mud. 
The homeowner, Don Sipple, calls police and Ezra is taken to a local hospital. Soon after, investigators find Ezra's 2003 Chevy Impala on a mud-covered road. Inside the car, the body of Alex Woodworth, stabbed 16 times. Ooh, Ezra McCandless will be sentenced Tomorrow, in a Wisconsin court, the 22-year-old was convicted of first-degree murder on November 1st of last year, and tomorrow she'll find out her fate. Time for you to chime in, our social media um, reaction. Let's start with our comment of the day. It comes from Shar. Should she get parole is the question. No, she shouldn't. Alex's life was cut short in her hand, at her hand. She never seemed remorseful, didn't even try to get help for him. She lied and lied and lied some more. Should never be free. Her age should not be a factor in the sentencing. Evil is evil, no matter what age. Joseph Marone, the age is a factor. Isn't, isn't the age of a defendant a factor, and shouldn't it be a factor for the judge in this case? Well, as far as the age is age of majority, obviously, um, is definitely a factor. For leniency. But given the fact that she's so young and, well, listen, I, there's more, there's many other factors that have to be considered in determining sentencing and whether or not she should be paroled. It just isn't her age. It's really, you know, the, the, the crime itself, whatever else she has done in society, um, her mental health condition. And I think the judge has to look at it as a whole to make a decision about whether or not she's ever paroled. It's just not her age. Yeah, and Norman Williams, her victim was young as well. Yes, I mean, there's so much going on here. I mean, the, the, the love triangle is crazy. And I understand <laughs> that the defendant suffers from uh, gender dysphoria. That's, that's going to be a factor. The other thing, though, that I find interesting is the, the way in which the body was mutilated, which indicates that there was something more going on than just getting rid of somebody. There's something very personal about this killing. And she's young. And she should be given a chance at some point. I certainly wouldn't want her to just do five years. I mean, because another young person's life is gone forever. You can't get that back. But yeah, she well, should be given a shot. Yeah, she's doing 20 minimum. It's up to the judge uh, whether she's going to do life without. Um, Kimberly Born, Boren says, now... However, I think she should get some help for her psychological issues, Rachel Kaufman. What about that as a mitigating factor that she has been diagnosed with psychiatric issues? Well, I think it's a mitigating factor, and just in general when it comes to criminal defendants, I believe that in a good argument to the judge, and I think it's just a good argument for society, is that everybody should get life with parole if they're, cause, because it incentivizes good behavior, um, if there's a hope of benefit. If there's no hope of benefit, then it's creating a really unsafe environment within the prisons. Um, also, they can always just deny her parole. Right. Michael so Dixon. That's, yeah, I just think that's it. there's an easy way out. It's life with parole, and they deny it if she's bad, period. Michael Bixon, the um, state has brought up what they're calling the Ted Bundy effect claiming that she wrote a paper in high school about Ted Bundy. She's obsessed with serial killers. Um, the using, which way do you think it goes? Is it a mitigating factor, her, her issues or mental health issues, or is it, uh, oh my gosh, she's creepy, too creepy to ever let out again, which is the, what the state is alleging. I think that honestly, her mental health issues are gonna be the number one issue for mitigation, more so than anything else. You know, and I don't think anyone here is going to deny that she has them. I mean, it, you don't carve boy into your arm without having some serious psychological issues, not to mention what she did, right? So I, I think that more so than anything, the psychological issues that she has and that she's going through are going to be the number one mitigation issue she has. What are those? And I, I think even more so than, you know, using it as, as an aggravating factor for the state. Um, you know, if they're going to say that she's a serial killer or something, we've seen no evidence of that. You know, and I, I certainly haven't seen anything to say that. Well, uh, lack of remorse, 16 times, killing, and stabbing, no, stabbing, stabbing, stabbing. No, there's a difference Creating between a passionate. love triangle. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a difference between being passionate and, and being hateful and being spiteful. Accusing people of rape and se uh, sexual assault. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, this I, goes on. I, think, I think that it's going to be an issue going on. All right, Nikki Wilson says no. Everybody says no. Uh, she should not. I am all for second chances, but not for a murder as brutal and as senseless as the one she's committed. She was cold and calculated in her crime and doesn't think she did anything wrong. 
So she will probably have no problem doing it again to the next guy she feels slighted by. Not admitting guilt, Joseph Marone, is that a problem for her? Because that's what she, she took the stand in her own defense. So during the case uh, in chief, dur during the defense case, she basically said, I didn't, I was in, I was reacting in self-defense. How can she now express remorse? Um, she could, should she? Well, listen, the judge is going to look for acceptance and responsibility on B. On B. Yes, but, but you know what? The, at this point that she's found guilty, the judge is going to want to see that the defendant has accepted responsibility for her actions. Without that, he's going to be hard-pressed to give her any leniency. So even though in her defense she took the position and she testified, claiming that she was in a self-defense mode, and that was her defense, obviously it didn't work and she was found guilty. Now that she has to address the judge, when he's going to make a decision for her sentence, okay, he wants to hear remorse from her. He wants to hear acceptance, which he's going to take that in consideration when he decides her fate. Norman, if she's your client, do you want her to address the judge? And if so, what does she need to do? Well, at times you don't want your clients to omit much for the purposes of appeal. You don't want them to destroy that. But I think that someone can act in self-defense and still be remorseful about what happened. You know, in this situation with 16 stabs to the head, it's a little hard. It's a little hard to imagine that that person would be remorseful in the future, but they can be. And I, and I think that a person that has so much going on in her head with her gender identity going back and forth sometimes, and, and I think she kind of lived by another name, there's a lot going on. There's a lot that the judge needs to unpack, or at least the defense needs to unpack for the judge, so that the judge can find some sort of mitigation. All right, Colleen uh, Balchak says no. She's just like Jody Arias, blacking out, brings weapons, etc. And uh, Ray Wallace says, oh yes, OMG, she is so like Arias. It's creepy. The narcissism, the love of discussing the sex, the coy behavior, the obvious manipulations, et cetera, on top of what you said, too. Rachel Kaufman, um, she, you said it earlier, she is very Arias-ish. There's something about the, the way that she misuses being like a damsel in distress to get what she wants, and then to then accuse people of heinous crimes, to then walk away from a murder where she stabbed a dude 16 times, a guy that she supposedly cared for, um, and then told somebody she didn't even remember her own name. It just all starts to sound kind of ridiculous. I will say that at um, sentencing, if she is going to say anything, I think that she needs to be very brief about what she says. And I do think, um, to what Mr. Williams had said, uh, Norman Williams in New York, that um, I think that being remorseful is actually the best way uh, to win a self-defense case. And maybe if she would have been a little bit more remorseful about the life that she took while she was in fear, she would have had a different outcome. I don't know. Final word, Michael Bixon, you're the judge here. What would you do? Well, it's tough because from her point, you know, I think that we are going to hear something from her. I think that there's going to be some remorse on her part. I think that it's going to be a conditional remorse. I don't think that she's going to come out right and say that she murdered the guy now. And I don't think it'd be easy to believe her because we've, we've heard her testimony. We've heard her talk about self-defense. So I don't think that she's going to say that, oh, you know, I, I was completely wrong. And, you know, this is totally not self-defense. I think we're going to hear a conditional, remorseful statement from her. And it is what it is. She's got to maintain her appellate rights going forward. I don't think she's going to, uh, she's going to give them up. So I think it's going to be sort of a, a conditional, remorseful uh, statement from her. And, and I think that the judge is going to probably be expecting that. And what would you give her? If I was the judge? Yeah. Well, I'm a defense attorney. <laughs> Wrong person asked. Oh, you'd let her go. I mean, yeah. For me, <laughs> I mean, it'd probably be, you know, life after and possibility 20, parole after 20. 25? All right. All right, we're going to leave it there. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk more about Harvey Weinstein. Who had a better day today? The prosecution rests. The defense starts their case in chief. We'll be right back. I was very surprised to be called as a witness for my brother's murder trial. It's just it's too much. On the next episode of OJ25. I heard the dog barking between 10.15 and 10.20. They believe that's when the murders happened. Did you know that for a fact? It was gut-wrenching. I'm turned into a circus. Nobody prepares you for that. An all-new original true crime series, OJ25. New episode tonight at 9, 8 central. Only on Court TV. And when you saw the defendant ejaculate. Objection. Overruled. It didn't look normal. It was like clumpy. 
Ms. Young, you just told the members of the jury the ejaculation did not look normal, right? Correct. You have never, ever, until this day, told anybody that, have you? No, I've said that before. Okay, when did you say that? I don't remember exactly when I said it. I'm going to show you a portion of the transcript from your conversation. Do you recall the question by Mr. Sharonis whether or not you had ever said prior to here today about what came out of the defendant's penis and it was unusual? Yes. Does reading that refresh your recollection about having said that in prior conversation? Yes. Lauren Young resumed cross-examination this morning by Damon Charonis. He was on fire, he was accusatory, and he really picked apart her statements over the last couple of years to law enforcement in Los Angeles as well as the Manhattan DA's office. And they may have seemed like minor things, but he made them a big deal. When you spoke to that friend, that friend told you about another meeting you had with Mr. Weinstein, correct? Objection. Overruled. Um, you asked if she told me about another meeting? Yes. Yes. And you don't recall that meeting, correct? Not vividly, no. Shona Luzzi stood up to say, Your Honor, the state at this time rests. There was that moment that it's done. There's some finality. But then there was a sidebar almost immediately, and these parties went up to the judge's bench, and we couldn't hear what was going on. But once these parties came back to their tables, the judge told the jury, actually, the state doesn't rest. They are going to call one more witness. And that's when Tara Lee Wolf walked back into the courtroom today for a very brief time to clear up the whole Gloria Bousset matter and this third encounter that she still says that she does not remember with Harvey Weinstein. What was the sum and substance of the conversation that you had with Annabella regarding Harvey Weinstein? I remember Annabella saying to me that she's done this crazy thing with Harvey. At the time, what was your understanding of what she meant when she was talking about something crazy? My understanding was that she fooled around with him. And did Mr. Ms. Annabella Shiora ever say anything to you about Harvey ever forcing her to do anything? No. Have you been in constant conversation and contact with Harvey Weinstein since you got paid on that contract up until today when you arrived in court? There were a few months period that I was pissed off at him and I was not in touch with him. Aside from that few month period, have you been in constant contact with him? Yes. There's some text conversations and there are some emails that he says some things. She made a really good point right before I walked out of the courtroom when she was saying, you know, you're telling Harvey Weinstein these women are crazy. So you were basically telling Harvey Weinstein whatever he wants, wanted to hear, right? And she said, and today now on the stand, you're telling him whatever he wants to hear. Isn't that right? She was pointing her fingers, classic Jonah Lucy style, and the jurors were even smiling, kind of in entertained at her antics. All right, day 12, who had the better day? Joseph, to you first. Austin. Go ahead, uh, Joseph, who had the better day today? Yeah. Prosecution or defense? Yeah. No comment from Joseph. because Are you oh, speaking to me? He can't hear. Um, no, I, I, the, the, the better, the, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. The better day today was definitely, the, the better day today, listen, without a doubt, Unfortunately, and I say because I'm a defense guy, it was the state, and I'll tell you why. The defense was supposed to come out with a big witness, a big bang, and his testimony was strong until they got to the point where they showed that there was an ongoing relationship. They had a falling out, and then they had an ongoing relationship. They were through text messages, and he was basically controlling this witness. And that, to, to me, was really hurtful to the defense at this point, showing that, obviously, Harvey Weinstein had his hand in it, and I don't think the jury's going to do very well with that. Norman? I think it may have been a tie. I think both sides made some points. I don't think that um, the defense witness was completely destroyed. Um, he definitely didn't come off the stand unscathed, but I think that there were some nuggets, and sometimes that's all we get as a defense, nuggets that can be used. Michael Bixson. I'm inclined to say the defense actually today. Mm. I, I think the witness they put forth is very critical for the case. Um, I think that he was essential to actually refuting some of the stuff that we've heard from some of the uh, prosecution's best witness. Um, so for me, I think it was overall a defense day. Rachel Kaufman, who had the better day? I think the defense had the better day. Um, Why? Partially, I'm just thinking partially because um, the fact that he had a continuing relationship um, with Harvey Weinstein and that maybe that shows a little bit of bias, he did so um, as an adult and made a conscious decision to continue interacting with him. He was not forced to do that, and I think that that's kind of... Um, illustrative or analogous to what we have going on with the women. That's if 
um, the state, in my opinion, the state hasn't proved it beyond a reasonable doubt. But if you're somebody who's pro-defense, I think that that's what you're looking for. All right. Thank you all. Uh, what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, let's check in with Chanley Painter to find out.